There's a cute metaphor that I like to use with my dance students whenever I'm talking about leading and following. It's one of those old school sayings, but to me it's actually a very profound philosophical statement with very deep waters. It simply goes like this. The lady is the picture and the man is the frame. In partner dancing, the ideal is that the man plays a supportive role while the woman plays a pictorial role. In other words, the man, who is the frame, supports the woman, who is the picture, just like a real frame amplifies and supports a real painting. One requires the other, and each is incomplete without the other. Yet despite being equals, both have distinct parts to play, and this is a very important point to remember in any kind of partnership. The man's role as the frame is to provide stability and also to control the timing of various actions in the choreography. Although at a high level, beauty is always a consideration for both in the partnership, the aim of the man is not to draw attention to his beauty, but rather to support the woman in maximizing hers by being clean, simple, and solid in his movement and presentation. This is why he is called the frame and why she in turn is called the picture. Yet there is an even more profound layer to this old saying and it has to do with freedom. As the leader, the man foregoes being the center of attention in exchange for being the center of control for the partnership. One cannot be both at the same time, and that is why in general the man trades being the picture for being the frame. It is also why things don't generally look or feel the same when these roles are reversed. Nevertheless, having to time actions and support the woman gives the man control. Yet this control comes in exchange for responsibility. In other words, leadership comes with a price. Ironically, the follower is the free one here. Remember that one cannot control the outcome and also surrender to the outcome simultaneously. You cannot be the picture and the frame, because the picture depends on the frame and the frame requires a picture. So for the woman, this relinquishing of leadership is actually a real blessing because she can fully surrender to the music and to the movement. It is up to the man to determine when things change and that means that she is free of that responsibility, free to shine, free to be, and free to dance. I have studied these things for many years and today in a world where freedom is increasingly more important to people, I believe that they offer priceless insights because the physical world points to the spiritual one. Unfortunately, many people have taken the world's wisdom about freedom and measure it in regards to material outcomes in some way or another. For example, some measure freedom by the amount of options that they have, like a buffet, while others measure their freedom by the amount of rights or privileges they have, like flexing a membership at a ritzy health spa or sailing on a private yacht. But is this freedom? The answer, of course, is no, because freedom cannot be measured in worldly things. In our consumer-driven world, we have more options for a given thing than at any point in history. And yet this has led many to decision fatigue, indecision, and buyer's remorse. Having more options is statistically proven to lead to analysis paralysis. And that is why anyone who works in sales will tell you that the goal is to always have just one real option among a couple of distractions for reference. The same goes for rights and privileges. While the previous type of freedom is lateral, this one is vertical. How many perks can you get? Where do you live? What kind of car do you drive? How much vacation time do you have? What's in your bank account? Science has shown us that money indeed opens up doorways by relieving certain burdens, but the cutoff is well below what anyone would consider wealth. In other words, after crossing the point of a decent yearly salary, about 75000 give or take based on location, increasing your income and privileges actually does very little to nothing for one's state of freedom and sense of happiness. On the contrary, these things often lead to less freedom because they need to be constantly maintained and worried about, enslaving you to your possessions and to the superficiality of culture. This is the problem with the world's version of freedom. Both lateral options and vertical privileges types of freedom are actually slavery. There is a third way that many search for freedom and this is through control. 
that is, the more things that they can control about their life, the more happy and peaceful and free they think that they will be. But is this freedom? Coming from a recovering control freak, I can tell you it most certainly is not. Remember now the picture and the frame that I spoke about earlier. The man, or leader, relinquishes a bit of freedom by being the center of control for the partnership. He must always pay attention. He must always monitor. He can't be too relaxed because it is his responsibility if things are not timed correctly. What this translates to is that there is a trade between control and freedom. In other words, the more you try to control something, or someone, the less free you actually become. Control is useful in life, but just like money, after a certain point it quickly becomes slavery because we can't fundamentally control anything. So you see, all the worldly measures of freedom are actually slavery. Your freedom does not exist in the amount of options that you have, nor does it exist in the amount of privileges or status that you can obtain in life. It also doesn't exist in the amount of things or people that you can control. With all this out of the way, what then is true freedom? Having looked for it in all these previous places and now having tasted the truth of the gospel, I can tell you with utmost certainty that true freedom is only found in Jesus Christ. There's now an important point about the previous things that I want to make, and I hope that you don't miss it. When you realize the futility of these ways of looking for freedom, it leads you to see the wisdom of surrender. This is contrary to our independent-minded culture, but in fact true freedom is only found in surrender. This seems paradoxical, but it is a mystery of life. Yet who or what you surrender to is very important here and this is the point. The object of your surrender must itself be perfect. Otherwise, if you surrender fully to something imperfect, what happens? What happens is that your surrender is now a vehicle back into slavery. Many people today come to this realization that true freedom is surrender, but like with everything good, the devil takes it and twists it immediately so that they become lost again. Drugs, sex, entertainment, hedonism, violence, self-glorification, and everything that our flesh desires are quick and easy things to surrender to if we do not have the light of the gospel guiding our way. This is what happens with addiction, and this is because addiction is the world's version of surrender. The truth is that everything in creation is designed to point us back to God, the one who created the world. After running the rat wheel of personal growth and new age philosophy, and being lost in all of the things that I just mentioned, I realized that surrender is the only way to be free. I realized that I can't actually control anything meaningful in my life, and that the world's answers to the pursuit of freedom were fundamentally flawed. Because of my professional experience in dancing, I also realized that much of what I had learned applies to this journey. Just like the woman is the picture because she surrenders, so too do we fulfill our purpose and bear fruit when we allow God to lead, to be our support, and to be our center of control in a partnership with Him. But this level of surrender requires the knowledge of the truth of our condition, that we are actually slaves in this world, doomed to die as such if nothing changes. We must come to terms with our inability to save ourselves from the problems of being human. And in so doing, we learn the truth of who we are and who God is. This creates a new space, a space for partnership, and within that partnership, we can finally begin to dance. Remember that the world's version of freedom is always slavery. And what this means is that we, of our own efforts or knowledge, would never snap out of the world's spell without some kind of intervention. The momentum is too great, and this is why we need a savior, why we must surrender and also surrender to someone who is perfect. In dancing terms, we cannot be our own picture, even though this is fundamentally our role as the follower. So what do we do? It seems like a conundrum, doesn't it? But the answer is where we take this old metaphor of the picture and the frame to its deepest levels of understanding. But first, a few important biblical ideas. The Bible says many times that we are dead in our sins. This is for a reason, because dead bodies cannot make any choices. Just like an object in motion will stay in motion unless it's acted upon by an external force, we too are in momentum towards a particular destination and are unaware of that momentum 
unless our eyes are opened by God. Yet when God does intervene in our lives to show us the truth, we finally gain freedom because the illusions of the world fall by the wayside. What once seemed foolish, which is the cross, is now a source of eternal life, and what once was sweet, our sin, is now revealed as a source of death. Put simply, we gain the ability to let go of the world, to make a different choice, and ultimately, to live. Another thing that the Bible says is that God is the only being in the universe who is perfect. Remember that in order for us to be free, we must not only surrender, but surrender to something, or someone in this case, which is perfect. If we surrender to the imperfect, we are slaves yet again. Yet this is it right here. The only place perfection exists is in God. He is the source of all life in the infinite mind which brought everything into existence. To be free then means we must surrender to God, just as the Bible tells us over and over again. One fascinating thing about God's perfection is that all of his choices are the best possible choices that can be made. In fact, God cannot make any bad decisions. It is impossible for him because he's perfect. And because he is uncreated and outside of time and space, it means that his will is actually the only, quote, free will there is. In other words, he's the only being free of influence of time and space and conditions, and therefore his choices are the only free choices made in history. God is also eternal and has always existed. And what this means is that he doesn't have the pressure of death to structure his decisions around, unlike us. These truths alone are enough to bend your mind in all sorts of directions. But by comparison, consider mankind. Every single one of our choices depends on what came before and what comes afterward in the timeline of our lives. And because we die, Everything we think and do is unavoidably connected to this absolute outcome in some way. Despite how independent we may feel about our choices, or how genuine or authentic they may seem to be, the truth is that we are completely conditional in our choosing and our existence because we exist in time and space and because we die. What this means in more plain language is that the idea of a human free will only exists by way of a relationship to God. How does this figure? The Bible says that we were made in the image of God. And if you understand Old Testament ideas about images or statues, what this means is that mankind was made as a living vessel to be inhabited by God so that God could use his will through us and work his perfect plan in our lives. This is what the gospel calls being born again. And it is what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. In this arrangement, we get the utmost pleasure and joy because a perfect being is exercising his free and perfect will through us, and he gets the glory for being perfect and sharing that perfection graciously with us when we neither deserve it nor could we ever earn it. There's now something very important to understand. In the very first book of the Bible, the devil tempted Eve with the idea that she could have this kind of freedom outside of a relationship with God. This illusion is alive and well today because our modern Western culture has adopted many Luciferian values from the Enlightenment, French Revolution, and Greco-Roman philosophy. We live in a culture that values rebellion as a virtue, but hopefully by now you can start to see why these things are illusions. The truth is that there is no freedom outside of God because outside of God we are predictable and a slave to the momentum of the world. We are a slave to sin, and we are doomed to die. We're also condemned because God has decided to judge this world at an appointed time because of Satan's trickery. And what this means is very simple. Nobody is getting out of the outcome. We have been given a free offer of pardon, but those who refuse the free offer of grace will have only justice as their reward. This means that all of the things that the world tells us are good and profitable and a source of freedom are actually sources of slavery and ultimately condemnation. So we must always be careful with the world's advice, even when it is clothed in good intentions. All of my life I have searched for freedom. I am an artist, a musician, an entrepreneur, a speaker, an author, and I'm very strong-willed. Yet today I thank God for showing me the truth 
that freedom is only found in Christ. The gospel testifies to our inability to do anything good for ourselves because of the cursed state of the world that we are born into, and this is by design so that we seek out the Savior. Our freedom, just like our righteousness, is not found within ourselves but rather in a relationship with the Creator. This was the intent all along from the beginning, to be free and fulfilled at a maximal level. Yet this level of being is conditional upon one simple thing, faith. And now we return to the cute dance metaphor that I gave you at the beginning, the one with such deep waters under its quaint little surface. When the woman steps into a challenging pose that requires her to be off balance in order to be beautiful, the only thing that matters is trust. She must have faith that her partner, the frame, will catch her and support her. If he isn't quite there, then her beauty will be compromised, guaranteed. She will shrink even if she's good at faking it. But if he's there 100% of the time and creates a trusting space, she can taste true freedom, knowing that she can take the leap and give everything she's got with no risk of being let go. It is here and only here where the magic happens, and indeed, it's a beautiful thing. Sadly, these moments are few and far between in our fragile human lives and relationships. And this is why I love dancing so much, because it has more of these moments and in a physical way. Yet with God who is everywhere, these moments are available all the time because he never fails and he is always there. And this is now the home run point. He is in fact both the picture and the frame. The Bible says in Romans 8 verse 29 that those who believe are being conformed to the image of Christ by a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them. Jesus is the perfect picture that entrances us, the one that we emulate and desire to become more and more like. This journey is not finished in this life, but rather in the next one. Yet nevertheless, he is the picture that we are created to image from the very beginning. This is why the answer is Christ, and not anything within ourselves like the world teaches us today. But Jesus is also the perfect frame that supports us unconditionally and supernaturally through this entire process. Because it is he who lives in us who believe, we have both the full assurance of a perfect outcome and a perfect lead to get us there. We are vessels in this dance of life, a dance where we follow his lead to become more and more like him. Jesus Christ is the answer to the human heart in its desperate search for freedom. I know because I was desperate for freedom and I have found it in him. Just as he famously promised in John 8 verse 36, quote, And if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Amen. What a profound thing to meditate on for the rest of eternity. And what a gift to wake up every day knowing that we are free from the things that truly matter. Free from sin free from death, free from judgment, and free from the spiritual slavery of the world. This is true freedom, and it is only found in Jesus Christ.